on the evening of the last American presidential election, there were two groups of Americans delirious with joy. One group consisted of the supporters of Donald Trump, elected on his promise to make America great again. God bless our president, Donald Trump! The other group were cannabis fans, who on the very same day had won legalization referenda in eight different states. It feels good! A green tidal wave is sweeping across the United States. More states are legalizing cannabis on prescription for medical purposes. Others are going even further and allowing the free sale of weed. In over half of America, pot is no longer synonymous with underground trafficking, dealers and cartels. It's now blooming in the open air the star product of a new generation of entrepreneurs who see themselves as 21st century pioneers, ready to go to any lengths to develop their business in the name of freedom and dollar bills. Welcome to the land of cannabis. Traveling across Cannabis America, we'll discover 50 shades of green. The country has as many different situations regarding the drug as there are states. This is because cannabis is still illegal at a national level, and the different states are running experiments of varying levels of audaciousness. Between federal prohibition and local legalization, there's a gray but sunny zone in which American weed grows. The departure point for our journey has to be California, the richest and most populous state. This is where it all began 20 years ago. Marijuana is part of the landscape here and was an integral part of the counterculture of beatniks and hippies. But in 1996, the status of cannabis underwent a change when it became a substance one could use quite legally for medical purposes. An official card procured by prescription granted access to specialized pharmacies. <laughs> this is what a dispensary of medical cannabis looks like today. This is in Oakland, in the suburbs of San Francisco. With a stripped-back design and muted atmosphere, it's like a cross between a chic drugstore and a specialized garden center. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I don't think I have 75 like the same nursery when it comes to cookies. So got like 25 of one. And then I have some uh, the platinum cookies from uh, Dark Heart. I'll, I'll just take these and then I'll, I'll come back. Kind of come back. Yeah. Okay. At Harborside, the customers are not customers, but patients. They come here for treatment, not to get stoned, even though the cannabis they buy still has the usual psychotropic effects. They have a choice of hundreds of products. The weed is available in 30 or so varieties, each with its own specific properties, and can be bought loose or in ready roll joints. But the patients can also choose from more concentrated resins, better known as hashish, or try more innovative forms of the drug in candy, chocolate cookies, drinks, pills, massage oils, or therapeutic creams. The dispensary's boss, Steve D'Angelo, personifies this green revolution which is sweeping across America. Now a shrewd businessman, in the 80s and 90s, he was one of those fighting to get the therapeutic benefits of marijuana recognized. The passage of California's medical cannabis law, the first in the world, 
in 1996 really grew out of the AIDS crisis in San Francisco in the late 1980s, uh, where there were funerals every weekend all throughout the city. People were dying. Everybody knew somebody who had a friend who had AIDS or, or who was dying from AIDS or who, who did die from AIDS. AIDS patients would just get so nauseous that, that they were no longer able to eat. They would lose weight and eventually die because of that. Uh, so cannabis Everybody's heard of the cannabis munchies. Uh, well, that really works, and it, it helped all of the AIDS patients uh, gain weight. And just by gaining weight and being able to eat and bring sustenance into their body, they were able to live much longer. Uh, and once we saw this, right, we began getting cannabis and giving it to other AIDS patients. And so that's why we had to change the laws. We had to change the laws because our friends were dying and the police were stopping us from saving their lives. So it was a very immediate need. It, it was not strategic. It was about saving people's lives. As well as for AIDS, cannabis is commonly prescribed as a secondary treatment for many conditions, such as depression, osteoarthritis, anorexia, multiple sclerosis, and some kinds of cancer. Here, for example, is a patient buying cannabis to accompany the chemotherapy she's undergoing for a brain tumor. Oh, that's right. You guys have me on yeah. uh, trying to figure out what, to, figure do. Out what yeah, to do. I had, a, had a, a round of chemo, so I'm trying to get past yeah, that. Get, yeah, get, get, get out of that chemo funk. So. Got you. I need um, a P3. You talking yeah. about the green label? The green one, the green yeah. label. Yeah, so you're still getting that THC. I still am getting some THC. Yeah. Just a little bit. Oh, so, so that's, that's why, why you're feeling I, a I little. I still feel a little. Yes, oh, absolutely. Okay. But you're not stony or right, high. Right, right. Like it's the, more, like CBD's more focused and right, clear right. without being high. Exactly. Yeah. My pain is better, way better. Mm -hmm. My speech is better, my tremors are better. Hey, that's cool. I'm glad we met. Yes. <laughs> I still am, have nausea, you know, off and on. Right, right. And all I have to do is take a little take bit. Take a little bit and it just knocks it out. Yeah. All right, thanks cool. my dear. It's always we'll good to see you next time. It's always good to Thank see y'all. Yeah, 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 for sure. Thanks for everything. That was awesome. That was super awesome. We have over 220,000 registered patients who are members of our organization. We serve about 1,000 patients every day, uh, and we have uh, over 250 employees now. But we have another shop, and we have a farm, and we have a factory, and a few other things going on. We rolled a Trojan horse into the heart of corporate America. The Trojan horse tactic is a winner. How can you go on banning a product that is recognized as having medical benefits? The legalization of medical cannabis leads sooner or later to complete legalization where it's freely sold over the counter. California voted for this in November 2016. Those in the business were already rubbing their hands. To prepare for that, uh, we're expanding this place. Uh, it will be twice the size a year from now uh, than it is today. Uh, we will be adding a whole lot of new features. We'll have a tasting room where people will be able to come in and actually taste and experience different types of cannabis right here uh, before they purchase it. Like any good businessman, Steve D'Angelo was thinking ahead. Long before the result of the referendum, he bought greenhouses a two-hour drive from his HQ in Oakland in Salinas Valley, where the more traditional lettuce is now being dethroned. With its temperate climate and constant sunshine, the birthplace of the writer John Steinbeck is a perfect spot for growing cannabis. Steve D'Angelo is thinking big. The greenhouses here cover almost four hectares, but there's already considerable extension work going on. And the 25 employees will be joined next year by a hundred new colleagues. The man in charge of the site is a local horticulturist who now cares for his cannabis plants as he used to for his roses and peonies. I've never seen the greenhouse business change like it has in the last six to 12 months. 
Fortunately, we got in a little bit early here because we were looking two years ago, but people that have been looking the last three to six months, they're paying probably four to six times normal market value. So next door was a house or a piece of property uh, with greenhouses on it that was on the market for years and years for a million dollars and not an offer. And then as soon as the cannabis rush started, he was offered $4.2 million. And to see these greenhouses coming back to life is pretty exciting to me too. So it's a beautiful business to start right now in this valley. Typically agriculture follows money. And if there's a good market value on cannabis, then then there'll be agricultural catching up very fast to cannabis. So I see that happening in the next couple of years. In California's Epicurean culture, cannabis is taking up a place center stage. Sea, sunshine, and weed. Nothing new about that, except that now, it's all legal. And very profitable. The pro-cannabis militants who used to fight for the right to smoke have understood that profit is the best weapon for changing the world. They're no longer lying back and counting the stars, they're counting dollar bills. Every decade or so, there's one or two big business booms uh, that really captures the public's attention and creates a ton of opportunity and a ton of wealth. Cannabis is the next big one for this decade. In 2016, this is a $6.7 billion market, legal market in North America. That's up 34% from 2015. I mean, you will not find another multi-billion dollar market growing at that rate anywhere else in the world. You know, I've been working to change the marijuana law since I was 18. And we saw business as a way to accomplish our political goals. Look, if you want something done in this world, figure out how to make it profitable and you can do it a lot faster. Legal cannabis is a new economic frontier. According to some, it could even be a solution to the downturn for those disenchanted Americans who brought Donald Trump to power. Adelanto, 50 kilometers east of Los Angeles, is a good illustration of the flip side of the American dream. There's little sign here of all that wonderful Californian prosperity. An abandoned military base has been replaced by a depressing prison. There are no businesses, just plots spread out in the middle of the desert far from everything. So Adelanto, a town that's been drifting since the 1990s, is throwing itself wholeheartedly into the cannabis business in an attempt to save itself. The man who threw the lifeline is called John Woodard. A former rock star manager turned entrepreneur, this Republican mayor got himself elected on the promises of pot. I love our new great president, Donald Trump. He's a businessman like Rich and I. If anybody needed to come and fix our broken country, it, it, he was the man. Well, many economic factors came to play here. They closed the base, I think it was about 1985 maybe. The troops and the, the Air Force guys and stuff that were here were all transferred to other bases. Some people, uh, just got up and left their homes. So the city really started to become pretty, pretty bad in disrepair. And then I discovered like Long Beach and then a couple of other cities that were in the same position at one time. And they turned the other cheek and they looked into medical cannabis. Now those cities are booming. So I went, aha, I found it, I found it. Encouraged by John Woodard, Adelanto has gambled on a green zone dedicated to growing cannabis. 21 gigantic warehouses for soilless cultivation, a total surface area of almost 40 hectares, and the gamble has paid off. Investors rushed out to the desert, 
The operation's finances were wrapped up in record time, and the price of this dusty land has since skyrocketed. It goes way out here. And it's uh, going way, on, way down the road over there. This is one of 21 buildings then, huh? 21. This is the very first one. As you can see, it's quite large. It's huge. I can't believe it. I think it's 200,000 square feet. This is like the size of a Walmart almost. Look what the city council's done here. We've got progress. We have opportunity. Yeah, let me get a picture of that. Just this facility alone. I could foresee probably 100 people working here, maybe. This entire project is projected at $60 million. Wow. What we see now is we see people moving to town. We see money coming to town. We see new construction coming to town. I mean, in two more years, you won't even recognize this place. Californian cannabis is growing quickly. Too quickly, perhaps. What will happen to this West Coast state, the world's sixth largest economic power, when this new industry is running at full capacity? The adventure that's been unfolding in Colorado, the state that's brought about a marijuana revolution, may give us an instructive glimpse of the future. Not so long ago, the Rocky Mountain State was mostly known for its chic ski resorts and an ecological awareness that one doesn't often find in the United States. It's a pioneer state for renewable energy and environmental protection. And its capital, Denver, is number one in America for cycling lanes. But in 2014, Colorado's image changed. The state's voters defied federal law by demanding a referendum on the free sale of cannabis. And local authorities followed their lead. Here's a message from the state of Colorado to the state of Colorado. Now that marijuana is legal here, we've all got a few things to know. But instead of just telling you what you can't do, we're going to tell you what you can do too. Here we go. If you choose to use, don't drive high. Instead, just walk or skip or catch a ride. You can even frolic or stroll or run. Just remember, you gotta be 21. That's to have and to hold and to buy and to use. Visit goodtoknowcolorado.com for more info. Cause when it comes to marijuana, it's good to know. In Colorado, anyone 21 or older can buy marijuana with no trouble. The boom has been swift. In Denver alone, there are over 100 retail outlets. These cannabis shops are often small, each with its own specialties, which are well known to regulars. You can even find them near gas stations, so you can fill up with gas and grass at the same time. In downtown Denver, the stores welcome a steady stream of novice tourists drawn to Colorado by the whiff of marijuana. Hi, how's it going? I'll just pick your IDs real quick. We do have pre-rolls. Thank you. And are you guys familiar with Indica and Sativa? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I try to tell her that sativas are the less body high and indicas are the body high. Yep. Yeah. Told you. And I'll show you. There's an easy way I remember it. Indica, like you said, is the body high, much more relaxing. So I remember it. Indica in the couch. Yeah. And you guys are more than welcome to smell and look. You just yes. can't reach in there and touch. Okay. And they just have little yeah. sticky things you can like wiggle. Yeah. Yeah. Every strain of marijuana actually does have its own unique flavor. Just like wine, it really is a very broad spectrum from earthy to fruity to crazy flavors. Um, and it's all just personal preference. Uh, usually I just show people two different smelling ones, see what they like, kind of start from there. Uh, do you know about the deal we have going on today? I do not. It's awesome. Normally, one gram is $60. Yeah. But today, if you buy more than one, they drop to 25 each. So okay. really, two for 50 or one for 60. Take off 14%. Oh, nice. No problem. 
Colorado has become the American testing ground for legalized cannabis. Nowhere else in the world had the entire chain, from farm to store, been legalized in this way. To understand the impact of this unprecedented green revolution, the state's government needed the services of an economist. Cannabis has become part of the bundle that is attracting people here. And you just have to, as you mentioned, you just have to look around and see how many cranes are here, how many apartments are being built, how many new restaurants open every month, how many new businesses are opening here or starting a Denver office. Uh, all of that is pointing to me that cannabis has become something that supports the economy and not something that takes away from it. So that $1.3 billion in sales was like $2.7 billion in total economic impact and created about 23,500 jobs. Denver right now is kind of like the Silicon Valley of cannabis. 3130. Okay. And that's not all. The marijuana that? business brings in an extra $120 million in tax revenue every year. The state of Colorado has chosen to spend this money on repairing schools and on drug information and prevention programs aimed at teenagers. Another immediate consequence of this boom in green gold is that Denver has quite unexpectedly become a major tourist attraction as visitors flock to sample the pot. For $70, for example, you can take a class in combined joint and sushi rolling. Hi guys, I'm Calix. I'm going to teach how to roll a joint with a crutch paper. This is going to be like equivalent to a mouth filter or like a cigarette filter. Um, and we're going to start off by grinding our marijuana. Those things in front of you are grinders. So our next step is going to be to roll our crutch paper. So I like to take the pointer hand and I just put my pointer finger holding that crutch and holding it in my hand. And then my dominant hand is going to load the weed across. And you're going to put it in as evenly as you can across the paper. Yeah. We also do tours through grow houses. And after that, we take a cannabis friendly bus where you can actually consume on the bus. And then we do a cooking class on Sundays where you learn the infusion and of cannabis into food and the process of doing that. And you get to do a hands-on one lesson with the chef, same chef that does the sushi and uh, joint rolling class. And we also do cannabis massages. So then you're gonna turn your joint sideways and in the flame and you're just gonna kind of crispen it like a marshmallow. Crispen it, golden it, black. So I'm not burning the paper that I just made, right? I just crispened that edge. That way you could just pull it off. Oh! <laughs> then you light it. Don't waste it. And you get high. <laughs> and that's how you roll a joint. So if you need help, got you. But in Colorado's government, they're not exactly kicking back and toking on joints. It's not easy being America's cannabis champion when grass is still forbidden by the federal authorities. The FBI could at any time close down all businesses related to marijuana. Well, when we first legalized it, I was against it. Um, almost everyone I know, elected officials, were against it. Uh, you don't want to be in conflict with the federal law. Uh, we were worried about young people thinking it was okay, there would be a giant spike, an increase in consumption. But so far, we have seen no dramatic increase among teenagers in their use. We have seen no great increase among any portion, any demographic of the population, except this last uh, poll, it appears senior citizens, people 65 and over, are uh, using more marijuana than they did three years ago. But, but there hasn't been any other dramatic 
change. We legalized marijuana and nothing really happened. Um, you know, the, the sun still rises in the east and sets in the west and, you know, people aren't getting in traffic accidents everywhere, or running around, doing crazy things. Uh, it's becoming uh, uh, just like any other um, product you might buy for your own recreation, just like a glass of wine or uh, a bottle of beer. And this large growth that you're seeing right now, that is the black market coming into the light, right? While legalization has significantly reduced the black market, it hasn't completely eradicated it. Since legal pot is only accessible to those age 21 or over, younger consumers are still turning to dealers. You know, drug dealers don't care who they sell to. And if we're able to get rid of that black market and get less drug dealers, then it's, a, I think, a much greater chance that kids won't get, they won't have as easy a time finding marijuana as they do now. While we are not happy about being in conflict with federal law, we recognize that that is a problem. We argue that, I mean, right now, 60% of the American people live in a state where either medical or recreational marijuana is legal. You can't turn your back on 60% of the people of your nation. This is going to be one of the great social experiments of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and maybe it's time that we let this experiment go forward a few more years and see whether it, it has a, a possibility of success. Yet nothing predisposed Colorado to become a pioneer of cannabis liberalization. It's far removed from the alternative culture of the West Coast. In this part of the Rockies, there have always been more cowboys and soldiers than hippies. And political resistance was stronger than in California. At least until a four-year-old girl changed public opinion all by herself. Little Charlotte Figgy was suffering dozens of epileptic fits every single day. But in 2012, one particular kind of cannabis oil, available only in Colorado, gave her back an almost normal life. So Charlotte's uh, story really starts with her parents uh, seeking a treatment that uh, was sort of a last hope for her. She had failed all pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, at the same time, we were producing a plant that was very high in CBD or cannabidiol, uh, which is the non-psychotropic uh, property that is in our product, uh, CW Hemp. And uh, she found us and convinced us to give Charlotte uh, some of the uh, product. She went a week free without any seizures. And this is uh, about the time she was having 300 seizures um, a week. Uh, so now, even today, she's 98 to 99 percent seizure-free. Charlotte's story educated the public about the therapeutic effects of cannabis. It was also the starting point for the first cannabis success story, that of the Stanley Brothers. It was not easy starting with Charlotte because she was a five-year-old girl. Uh, while we knew cannabis was safe, Giving uh, medical marijuana to a, a child was another topic in and of itself. So for us, we had to get two doctors' approval. So Charlotte had to see two doctors, and they had to approve of this uh, treatment for her. Uh, after that, once we saw the, the uh, success that Charlotte had, we knew that this was going to be big, and a lot of the barriers would fall over the coming years. Located in Boulder, northwest of Denver, the Stanley Brothers Laboratory has perfected the world's best-selling cannabis derivative, which they call Charlotte's Web. It doesn't contain any THC, the chemical compound which makes you high. Its efficacy depends on the calming and anti-inflammatory effects of another component. CBD, or cannabidiol. In the wake of Charlotte Figgy, entire families have moved to Colorado, purely to buy cannabis with which to treat their children. But the cannabidiol oil developed for Charlotte doesn't work for everyone. In some cases, THC has to be present too. 
Tyler was born with cerebral palsy, aggravated by a rare form of epilepsy. His parents discovered that cannabis reduces the violence of his fits, but the lack of medical research means that there's no precise information regarding the dosage or composition. It is therefore a process of trial and error to find the right treatment for their son. So I keep um, Tyler's cannabis. Each week I pull it up into syringes um, and I get it ready to go for the whole week. He gets one syringe in the morning and one syringe at night. And then during the day, if I need to give him any, um, I'll give him extra. So I started, um, I learned how to make um, uh, my own concentrate oil. So I buy a high THC bud um, and I make it. I, I soak it in the alcohol and I filter it and I cook it down. Um, and it makes a very thick, um, I can't even push it out, it's so thick. And it just needs a tiny bit, not much. So this is my son, Tyler. Say hi, bud. Yeah, and we just put it right into his mouth. That's all he needs. You know, you just have to play. You have to try a tiny bit, and if it works, maybe try a little bit more. Um, you talk to other families. Some families might say, don't give a lot. If you give a lot, it might be too much. Um, it's just trial and error. It, you just have to, until they do research and until we know you know, and every kid's different. Some kids need a drop, some kids need a whole bunch. Um, so we really don't know until, you know, you start playing around with it and, and trying. For scientists, cannabis is a virgin continent begging to be explored. At the University of Colorado Boulder, Understanding this very special plant is a top priority. The Department of Biology is in a race against the clock to carry out the world's first mapping of the marijuana genome. This could deliver a real economic jackpot in the form of patents. So promising are the pharmaceutical applications. Thus was born the Cannabis Genomic Research Initiative a grouping of 10 or so researchers. Daniela Vergara was one of its founders. Um, cannabis is part of the family Cannabiaceae, and there is a lot of biological functions associated with the endocannabinoid system. These are some of them, pain, seizures, nausea, appetite, mood, memory. And the thing about cannabis is that it's not just one compound. Cannabis is the uh, most widely used drug in the world and we really do not know much about it. We know that there's as much diversity between the cannabis individuals as there is between us and chimpanzees. So there's a lot of diversity. If you wanna breed for particular characteristics, you need a map, you need to figure out where in the genome you are, where are the genes in, in the plant's genome that are related to um, the production of these compounds that help people with seizures or that help people with pain. So if we understand the plant's genome, we're gonna be able to understand how to generate these plants that have particular characteristics for a particular illness. It's definitely longer than for other plants, but we are getting there. Cannabis research is riding a wave of popular enthusiasm. The testimony of parents who have moved to Colorado to treat their children gets huge media coverage. The most effective spokespersons for the legalization of cannabis today are not dreadlocked aficionados toking on joints, but sick children. It's a cultural shift which is radically changing the way people think about pot even in the most remote and conservative parts of the country. North Dakota is one of the least populated states in America with only four inhabitants per square kilometer. A lot of the terrain here is so poor and rugged that it earned itself the name Badlands.
There's not much to see here, apart from the last troops of bison and the shale oil wells which have been turning for 10 years or so. And a few unlikely sculptures which humorously celebrate the rural character of this far north state on the Canadian border. Two-thirds of the people here voted for Donald Trump. But on the same day, they also voted in a referendum to legalize medical cannabis, carrying the vote with the same two-thirds majority. This local artist, whose giant sculptures decorate the endless roads of North Dakota, sees no contradiction in this. I vote for what's best for the American people, and I felt at this stage in our history that we needed uh, a change in government. We needed government, less government. We needed people, and that's where I felt a vote for Trump was in, in line. I also voted for medical marijuana. I feel that uh, cannabis can help make America great again, and the reason it can is that uh, hemp is a product that can be used in so many, so many thousands of different applications. And I, I see it as, as a farming community and ranching community. I see hemp as a crop that can be uh, benefit our farmers. Yet medical cannabis' victory in the referendum surprised everyone here. In Fargo, the state's largest town, we meet the retired couple who were behind this spectacular turnaround. Anita and Ray Morgan discovered the benefits of cannabis after an operation left Ray in constant pain. When he realized that marijuana relieved this much more effectively than opium-based painkillers, he wanted his fellow citizens to share in the benefits. Ray and Anita led a campaign for legalization with a few fellow militants and a derisory budget of $18,000 taking the legislative process into our own hands was uh, something I never thought in a million years that I could make happen or be involved with. How did we learn? We learned as we went how to reach people through social media, to involve them in the, in the whole idea of um, what medical cannabis could or couldn't do. For example, we had 107 volunteers all across the state of North Dakota. They were everywhere. Our oldest circulator of the petition was a wonderful grandma lady in her mid-80s. And she <laughs> snuck the, the petition into the fairgrounds and asked people, would they please sign the petition? We had, I mean, everywhere we had people. And it was totally a grassroots, homegrown, hometown uh, effort. Ray and Anita called their bill in favor of medical cannabis, the Compassionate Care Act. I have been suffering from multiple sclerosis for 15 years. It is extremely difficult living day to day, the type of pain. The campaign's ads, shown on local television, deliberately focus on the emotions and empathy for the sick while exploiting the codes used in the kinds of commercials which the pharmaceutical industry runs all day long. The quality of my life. North Dakotans take care of one another. That's why I'm asking for you to vote yes on Measure 5. I think that the legislature has to realize that this is not just a bunch of crazy pot smokers. These are people who want an alternative to medicines with addictive possibilities and long-term side effects, that is worth pursuing. Yet turning a referendum into law isn't that simple. In North Dakota, local representatives are dragging their feet over the clauses of the law. In the state capital, Bismarck, we went to meet Richard Wardner, leader of the Republican majority in the North Dakota Senate. 
He describes himself as a conservative Christian and is fiercely opposed to cannabis, as he is to all drugs. We're aware of what's happening in other states, especially in Colorado, and uh, we really don't want that to, to happen here. I think they, you know, marijuana leads to using other drugs, which leads to crime. It affects your workforce. It affects your job force. Uh, it affects people that uh, are not going to be as productive. That's what I see, a deterioration of our society. There's no question I voted against the medical marijuana uh, measure five, but when it passed, the people spoke. We do believe in that in this state. When the people speak, we need to respond, and we did. We had to make corrections to some of the things in the petition. For example, you could grow it yourself. Well, there would have been all kinds of patches of marijuana growing around North Dakota, and we wouldn't have known which ones are legal and which ones weren't. And so that was one of the things that was tightened up in the uh, legislation. The original project included provisions for home growing because of the enormous distances in the state. North Dakota covers an area equal to a third of France. The winters are long and harsh, and it's not easy to get around. Yet for the moment, the authorities are only thinking of granting licenses to eight stores across the entire state. Far too few in the opinion of the militants who brought about the referendum. We had to compromise on some things and oh, we've had people say, you should have fought it in the courts, they shouldn't have touched it. And then you start thinking, well, that's, that's all fine and good, but it ties it up. And so I think we may have given up things in hopes that the Department of Health will be true to their word when they said, yes, we will have it up and running in a year. I just hope that we gave up the right thing. It bothers me, still to this day. The example of North Dakota shows that the cannabis revolution is well underway. Professionals in the sector are ready to leap from the starting blocks. Always more cannabis, always more consumers. It's a market with huge expansion possibilities. The mood is relaxed at the Cannabis World Congress, hosted for the fourth year running by New York, just off Times Square. The city of every excess and every culture, but also the capital of business, couldn't remain indifferent to the marijuana boom. For the moment, New Yorkers only have legal access to cannabis by prescription, but that doesn't mean they can't promote the product in its many forms. This year, the organizers have announced a 30% increase in the number of businesses present at the Congress. The 300 exhibitors cover every aspect of the business, from growing to derivative products. So with our sublingual technology, you just kind of let it hang out there in the mouth, and you're going to feel its effects in 10, under 10 minutes. There are sellers of vaping gadgets and distilling equipment. That's the heating session right there. Um, That's low software sound. developers. Mm -hmm. If you have cancer, MS, seizures, PTSD, mm -hmm. our app allows you to track your progress mm -hmm. and your patterns to determine what works for you. Corporate lawyers, accountants, investors, not to mention producers of food pellets for animals. And to create a bit of a buzz, vocal celebrities like Jesse Ventura, a former professional wrestler and governor of Minnesota who is now a convert to the benefits of cannabis. Donald Trump wants to create jobs? Simple, pull off the federal ban on cannabis. <laughs> now I'm gonna shamefully tell you what I want out of this. I want to be the first elected government official who will endorse a strain of marijuana.
All of the players in this new business have the same ambition, to carve themselves a nice big slice of this ever-expanding pie. They all have their eyes on the comfortable purchasing power of the middle classes, who could provide a rich stream of new consumers far removed from traditional joint smokers. There's no shortage of imagination. The company Canacorp, for example, has already raised around $6 million for their attempt at seducing more hesitant consumers. We've developed a desktop vaporizer that's called the Canacloud, and it takes pre-filled cannabis pods that our cultivators fill with their cannabis product. So it's kind of like the Keurig of cannabis vaporization, a pod-based system. Ultimately, medical and recreational are not the only categories that we see of the cannabis user. We think there's a big, broad spectrum in between that uh, are people just really seeking wellness. We have to convince people that um, using cannabis is really very similar to going home and having a glass of wine. We're targeting with our Canna Cloud that a little bit unsure mainstream consumer who might look at a, at a bong or a pipe and think it looks like drug paraphernalia, but they look at the Canna Cloud and they think it's a beautiful, presentable, approachable device that could sit in the kitchen and you don't have to put it away when mom comes over, for example. In the euphoric atmosphere, one could almost forget that there is a huge cloud of uncertainty still hovering over cannabis. It's illegality at the federal level. The whole pot economy depends on the political decisions made by the new Trump administration, which could always choose to take a step backwards and impose a total ban on the rebellious states. For the moment, Washington is taking a laissez-faire attitude but the threat is there in everyone's mind. Roger Stone, a former advisor to Donald Trump, is present in New York to reassure everyone. We as conservatives say we're for states' rights. States' rights when it comes to gay marriage. States' rights when it comes to abortion. So to be intellectually consistent, you have to be for states' rights when it comes to the legalization of cannabis. And then as fiscal conservatives, let, let's look at the hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue that legal cannabis sales are generating for state and county governments. I think those arguments will hold water with Republicans. I put my faith in Donald Trump, who I've known for 40 years. Um, he thinks outside the box. He's not an ideologue. He's interested in facts. He's a pragmatist interested in results. Uh, and I think once he sees all of the facts, it would only reinforce his instincts, which already led him to say that he supports states' rights. So yes, I'm optimistic. Despite Roger Stone's reassuring words, all the cannabis business players know that they're on shaky ground. Donald Trump is as unpredictable about this subject as he is about so many others. And it's at the highest instances of the nation that the future of weed will be decided in the years to come. Washington is the federal capital of the United States, home of all the national political institutions. Here, too, the wind of history is blowing in the direction of cannabis legalization. In the corridors of Congress, politicians of every stripe are working to rally the still coy states to their cause and break down federal reticence. Early in the year, Representatives of the left and right formed a cross-party pro-legalization group. Among them is a conservative representative from California, a former special assistant of President Reagan. We have limited money, as does every government in the world, and uh, I think it is a tremendous waste of, of valuable resources for us to spend money and the time of our, of our law enforcement specialists trying to convince people or prevent people from smoking a weed in their backyard. I mean, that is about as ridiculous as it comes. And as I say, 
it's a freedom issue. But we know that the process of Trump deciding what he's going to do is the most important element of what's going on. And uh, I'm apprehensive. I don't know what that's going to turn out. I'm going to try my best to get to President Trump on this issue and talk to him for a few minutes. And uh, we'll see if I'm able to do that and whether that has the impact that I, that I want. I'm very concerned about it. It's just I am a, I'm a surfer and I don't get upset about too many things. Dana Rohrabacher's main ally is his polar opposite on the political spectrum, a liberal environmentalist Democrat from Oregon. I don't know that anybody knows what to expect from this administration. On a day-to-day -day basis, people are surprised, including people who work with the administration. Um, it's not consistent, but right now, the American public has moved on. Right now, we have an emerging industry. Right now, millions of people benefit, for example, from legal medical marijuana. Uh, and I think that, uh, that that train has left the station. That's not going to be reversed. And there will never be another president of the United States that is elected who is not pro-cannabis. The United States of America is today the world leader in cannabis business. It's also the testing ground for inventing the policies by which this new market will be regulated and is already providing inspiration for countries such as Canada, Mexico, and even Colombia. In Los Angeles, Denver, Boston, and New York, the industry is gaining power. Supported by its lobbies, its expansion can only accelerate in the years to come and will no doubt soon be knocking at the doors of Europe. 